So oxygen today, in retrospect, <coughs> seems to be a very well-established concept, and not, not, and not only that, seems to have a referent. It helps too that new imaging devices that can image things at an atomic level have now finally given us pictures of oxygen. That we can now actually finally see either the, the molecule itself or the effects of the molecule at a very microscopic level. So the evidence has been accumulated in its favor and the evidence has been accumulated against logistics. Now, why am I talking about this? Because the word signifier today, a hundred years after Saussure wrote, is still like phlogiston or like oxygen at the end of the 18th century. It is still a theoretical term that we don't know yet whether it in fact has a referent. Why? Why is that? Because there are two, three, four, five other competing linguistic theories, Chomsky and linguistics, for instance, which are every bit as successful as Assyrian linguistics, in the sense that they both account for the same linguistic facts, in the sense that both can, given a, given, given a dictionary of the words of English, or given a dictionary of the words of, of, of uh, German, or of the words of French, the, 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 the model can produce the infinite number of sentences that make up a natural language. That's basically the test that a linguistic theory has to pass. Can you reproduce the phenomena of language? But because we have two or three or four different theories that can do the same thing, the situation today is similar to the situation between oxygen and phlogiston. We still don't know. Is it signifiers and signifies? Is it patterns of, of inscriptions that get submitted to rewriting rules, part of a, of a universal grammar, like Chomsky believes? Or is it like Zillig Harris, my favorite linguist and the one that I use the most? They are simply patterns of co occurrence of words in everyday language, statistical patterns of co-occurrence. Entirely different entities, much like oxygen and phlogiston, and yet the theories just like oxygen and phlogiston, explain one particular phenomenon. So the fact that we are still at the level, uh, or at a, 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 a period of time where we have not yet established the existence of signifiers, makes it important that we treat that notion carefully. We shouldn't dismiss it right away, but we should treat it carefully. For instance, until we know that signifiers actually exist, until, we, until Saussurian linguistics defeats Chomsky and and, and Harrisian and the other types of linguistics that are out there that are perfectly viable, we, don't, we cannot be ascribing capacities to the signifier that, that are you know, powerful capacities, like the capacity to generate subjectivity. Remember that in the Lacanian uh, 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 vision of the world, signifiers produce the subject in their circulation, in their movement. And that means that we are ascribing capacities, the capacity to generate subjectivity to an entity that has not really been shown to exist yet. That is a risky theoretical maneuver, and one that I just want to make you aware exists. It is still risky to be ascribing these capacities to signifiers. Deleuze saw this very clearly from the, from the early 60s. And he began moving in a very different direction. He began moving in the direction of Selig Harris, he doesn't, mention, he doesn't mention him by name, but he does mention the school that he belongs to, in particular in the book on Foucault. Uh, but he also he liked very early on the work of a very different linguist. His name is William Labo. The school to which William Labo belongs is called sociolinguistics, and it's not it's not like the linguistics of Chomsky, not like the linguistics of Saussure. It's a linguistics that tries to go out there and examine linguistic materials in their materiality a, a, empirically, not trying to figure out things as a formal model in a more or less a priori way about a single language. Labov wants to study populations of languages, and within each language he wants to study populations of people speaking that language. Labov became very famous in the 1940s for being the first linguist ever to use a tape recorder. A tape recorder as a, as a, as a scientific instrument to record sonic matter, or to become, or to record, you know, acoustic materiality. And the experiment he conducted, which was influential on the list, 
was to, we was living in New York at the time. He took his tape recorder and went to three different department stores. Uh, one that was representative of the upper class, I think it was Saks Fifth Avenue. One representative of the upper middle class or middle class Macy's. And I believe at the time it was, there were no Kmart's or anything like that. It was Woolworths that was the representative of the kind of lower class. And he went there with his tape recorder and his microphone and just began to record sounds. He didn't care what they were talking about, if they were buying underwear or buying socks or returning clothes and arguing over. He just wanted to know what, what, he just wanted to gather linguistic material. And he came back with a lot of material in his, in his tape recorder to his studio and, and began analyzing it and discover something that we could have discovered if we had conducted the same example, that different social classes, even though they are speaking the same standard English, have different pronunciations. There was a slightly R-less pronunciation for the upper class, there was another very different pronunciation for the middle class, and there were other pronunciations, including words like use people, you know, the second person pronoun in plural with an S added to it, uh, for the lower class. And he, so he for the first time discovered that linguistic materials are stratified following social classes. Something that he couldn't have discovered without a tape recorder and a microphone. And Labov, the reason why he did that, the argument he gave is this. He said, look, French or English or any other language exists in many dialectic in, in the form of many dialects. There's not only Parisian French, the French from Paris, which linguists today call Francien, which is of course a very real form of French, but there's also the competing form of Lyon, there's also Provençal French, several versions of Provençal, there's also Norman French, so there's no such thing as French itself. When one talks of French itself, one talks of the particular standard French, that the French Academy of Language, which was created in, this, in, this, in, the, 16, in the early 1700s, created. Academies of Language are organizations which are chartered by the king to freeze language in its current state. Not language in general, the language of the upper classes, the language that Lavo recorded in his, in, his, in his tape recorder. You take the language of the upper class, you create dictionaries that contain only the words used by the upper class, you create artificial grammars, well, not artificial, but uh, uh, a, a, a models of a grammar that correspond to the grammatical patterns talk, spoken by the upper class, and then you create spelling systems uh, and rules of pronunciation that correspond to the patterns of the upper class. Because you are an organization staffed by linguists, and you can publish those dictionaries, you can publish those uh, rules of pronunciation, you can publish those grammars, you can have a large effect on the population, and the, the intention was to freeze language in its current state, to freeze the upper language of Paris, in the, of Parisians, in its current state. Why? Because as they argued, if we allow language to change, as it has been changing since, since the Roman Empire, broke down and, and a multitude of romance languages began to, to pro proliferate, then people won't, in the future won't be able to read the literature written in this century, in the past few centuries. Language will change so much that unless we freeze it the way it is right now, people won't be able to read the masterpieces of literature that are being written right now. So there was no evil intent here. There was some real project of rescuing literature and, and kind of in a kind of museum, in, kind of, in the way in which museums try to preserve a, a, a objects of the past, but it had a very real, according to William Lavoe, a very real effect on linguistics. Why? Because the, like the French that Saussure spoke as a university professor or as a, as a scholar, and the English that Chomsky spoke as a university professor as a scholar were, of course, standard English and standard French, that is, two artificially frozen languages which gave you a sense of immobility and, 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 and lack of change that was not there. Had they studied to create their theories a variety of dialects, a heterogeneity of dialects, they would have come up with very different theories. 